Hello and welcome to today's Daily Bible Study. My name is Geoffrey Farrer and I'm Minister of Barnes, Putney and Roehampton Methodist Churches in the Richmond and Hounslow Circuit and it's lovely to welcome you again today. This week in our Bible studies we have been considering the resurrection appearances of Jesus and we've looked at the accounts in Matthew's Gospel and Mark's Gospel and two accounts from John's Gospel. And some of you may be thinking, well, why no Luke? And the reason for that is that Luke's account is the set text for Sunday. And I know it's many people's favourite account of the resurrection, the way to Emmaus. But don't worry, uh, my colleague and friend Deacon Cathy Johnson will be preaching about that on Sunday. And the video will be available on this channel. So we haven't forgotten Luke, don't worry. When I was first drawing up the list of scripture readings for this week, uh, we were thinking exclusively about the Gospels. But then I was reminded very forcibly that an equally important uh, account of the risen Christ is to be found in the book of Acts. And that, of course, is the appearance of the risen Christ to the Apostle Paul. Now, at this stage, of course, Paul isn't Paul. He's Saul. And thanks to the Acts of the Apostles and to the letters of Paul, we know quite a bit about Paul. And we know, and I'm sure this reading is very familiar to you already and the character and person of Paul, but just very briefly to sum up, we know that Paul initially, or Saul, sorry, I should say, was initially a persecutor of the church. And we're told earlier in chapter 8 that Saul was ravaging the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women, and committing them to prison for, uh, for following Jesus and for spreading lies about him as he perceived them. And we also know that he, he uh, uh, stood by and watched the stoning of Stephen in chapter 7. And we also know from Paul's own writing that uh, quite a bit about Paul where he was uh, born in Tarsus and that he was a Pharisee. And that uh, we encounter Pharisees in the gospel, of course, and uh, that meant that Paul would have known his scriptures very well, as, as he shows in his writings, uh, and that he would have followed all Jewish custom and tradition. And he describes himself as being very zealous for the faith and for the law. But of course, all that is about to change. Um, and I think we don't need much more introduction before I read from that experience that does change Paul completely. And I read to you from Acts chapter 9, beginning at the first verse. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were travelling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now, as I say, I'm sure that reading is very familiar to you. It's one we often have in church on Sundays. But there's a couple of things worth pointing out. Or a couple of things that stand out for me. The first of all is that um, Saul is off to Damascus and this reading and Damascus always have a special place for me because um, several years ago I was lucky enough to travel to Damascus um, shortly before the terrible civil war that tore the country apart and one of the first places I went was Damascus and it really is an incredible and beautiful city and one of those places where you really feel the hand of history upon you. And you can still travel to Damascus and see the street called Straight, where Saul was taken after this experience, and the house of Ananias, which is now a Christian shrine and chapel, uh, where 
They believed that Saul was taken afterwards. And it's a very special place to be. And it felt very exciting to be there. And so I always imagine that when I hear this reading. But it also reminds us that Jews and Judaism was not confined to Israel. That several centuries before the time of Jesus, Jews had begun to travel extensively and to settle across the Mediterranean. And they had established large communities in places like Alexandria and in modern day Greece and of course in Rome. And uh, there they established synagogues as we there, their places of assembly where they would gather and discuss the law. And um, so it was natural that one of the first places to hear the good news of Jesus were these synagogues. And when we look at the letters of Paul and when we read the stories, we see how Paul, whenever he travelled anywhere, first went to the local synagogue. And so it's important to recognise how Christianity was originally seen and uh, was seen by its adherents as part of Judaism. It was uh, part of that faith. It wasn't something separate initially. And it's also important to remember that um, it says here uh, that any who belonged to the way and Christianity wasn't known as Christianity at this time, still part of Judaism. The apostles were still worshipping in the temple, we know. Um, it was referred to instead as the way. And uh, it's interesting how that theme we find in the Gospels with Jesus meeting people along the way and people following him on the way and how we still think of Christianity as a journey, how we still think of people coming to Christ and walking through the journey of their life with him, uh, following the way of the Lord. And it's not only, of course, men, but men and women who are following the way. And that's a vital reminder to us of what we see in the Gospels and in the letters in the New Testament, that women and men play an equally important role in the early church. It's also important to note how Saul's encounter with the risen Christ uh, resembles many other divine encounters in the Old Testament. The bright blinding light, the falling to the ground like Daniel and Ezekiel, and that double repetition of the name, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And it can bring to mind um, encounters like uh, gods with Abraham, 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 or Jacob, Jacob, or Moses, Moses at the burning bush, or Samuel, Samuel. So we clearly see how Saul is standing in the line of patriarchs and prophets who are called by God to do exceptional things. And finally, just to note how this story was clearly absolutely vital for Paul, as he would become, Paul's self-understanding. Because I read to you from chapter 9, but I could also read to you from two other accounts in the Acts of the Apostles and another account from the letters. And clearly Paul told this story repeatedly uh, on many occasions to explain who he was and why he was doing the things that he was. Now there's much that we could say about this passage and much that has been said. But I'll just make two brief points. Firstly, the passage calls upon us to reflect upon what we understand by vision. Now, we can have a, um, we can look down on the term vision because it can mean to us something spectral or unreal or visionary, something that's going to happen in the future. It's something not tangible. And we might think about some of the other encounters we've had, especially in John's Gospel. Um, where Jesus says to Mary Magdalene, um, do not touch me, in, in, in Italian or Latin, noli me tangere, um, from which we get the word tangent, uh, tangible, uh, do not touch me. And um, we might think of uh, Thomas saying, well, unless I touch you, um, I'm not going to believe it. And we can perhaps make a div division in our minds between that which is tangible, that which we can touch, like Mary Magdalene wanted to do and Thomas wanted to do and that which is um, ethereal and spiritual and visionary. And this account 
challenges us to think, well, what do we understand by what's going on here? Is it something happening in Paul's mind or is it something more real? And the answer must be, our second point is, that it was real for Paul. It was real in a way that is more real than much reality, perhaps, because it changed Paul utterly. It completely turned his life around. There was really very few aspects of his life that were not affected by this. It changed the way he interacted with um, his faith, presumably with his friends and family, with the way he chose to lead his life. And many of the things that he held, held most dear about the dietary requirements and other things, he put aside because of this encounter, because of what happened on the Damascus Road. So, however we understand that term vision, it was incredibly real for Paul. And Paul's experience led him to make radical statements such as, Jesus is Lord. A very simple phrase, Jesus is Lord, one we find repeatedly in the New Testament and in um, early Christian writing, but a one that is completely radical and revolutionary when you step back and think what that means. Because if Jesus is Lord, then Jesus is God, and also Caesar is not Lord. So Jesus is equated with God and he is higher than all other forms of authority. And it's important to see how, um, if we try and sum up all the resurrection experiences, how the risen Christ, the appearance of the risen Christ to the apostles and the followers of Jesus was all really about change. It was about changing them. And many people, many commentators, have seen how the disciples in the Gospels are very different from the disciples afterwards. They are changed people. They are people who are no longer frightened or timid or running away. They are leading. They are visionary. They are speaking out publicly. They are risking their own lives because of what they have seen. And they change the, the risen Christ causes a change in them which causes an enormous change in the world and that change has continued for 2,000 years where women and men have experienced Christ in various ways from um, the visions of St Francis to other encounters and it has led them to change their lives and in many cases to change the world for the better. And in my own life and my own ministry, I have seen how people's experience and understanding and encounters with the risen Christ and the power of the resurrection has changed them utterly and caused them to turn their lives around for the better. And so as we reflect upon all of the resurrection experiences this week, I'd like to leave us with the challenge, how does the resurrection change us? How does the resurrection change our world? I hope you found it helpful to think about all those experiences at the same time and I hope that we've given you enough food for thought and room to ponder. Do always come back with comments or questions and I'm just sorry that we cannot go round the room now and hear everybody's views. Before we close today let's just have a time of prayer. Loving God, we give you thanks for the resurrection of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the hope that that gives us, the hope for all humanity and for all your world. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you would continue to appear to women and men and that the power of the resurrection would continue to change and inspire our world for the better. Be present with us, we pray, O Lord, this day and always. Amen. Please do um, 
uh, check the website, uh, check the uh, YouTube channel on uh, Sunday for our Sunday service where Deacon Cathy will be preaching about uh, the missing resurrection experience, the way to Emmaus. And then next week I'll be leading all five sessions and reflecting on the theme of